Strikes on Eurostar this weekend and over the August bank holiday. The RMT union says it's about their members' work-life balance. The companies say if you're booked, you'll travel. The government suggests the union's spoiling for a fight across the industry. The unions are calling more strike action against progress and against moving forward and against modernising the passenger experience. It's simply not good enough. Also this lunchtime... Silver to Great Britain! Silver in Rio for Britain's relay men and for Siobhan O'Connor. Come on, go, go, go! Go! Come on! But it all got a bit tense for her grandma and grandpa back in Bath. And from the casual to the catastrophic, more than half of all women say they've suffered sexual harassment in the workplace. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Alistair Stewart. Good afternoon. The RMT union says long hours, excessive overtime and Eurostar's unwillingness to honour an agreement are their reasons for action. They say it's about work-life balance and will hit travellers this weekend and over the busy bank holiday at the end of the month. The company says it won't. They have contingency plans and anyone who is booked will travel. But it comes at a time when the RMT is already taking action on Southern Railway and threatening a walkout on Virgin's East Coast Line. Paul Davis reports on growing disquiet on the railway. It has all the makings of a miserable summer for thousands of rail users, with unions voicing multiple causes of discontent and threatening disruption to services in the north and south of England and beyond. Eurostar routes are the latest affected, with the RMT union announcing action on some of the busiest days of the summer. Today, the union announced planned walkouts for this weekend, starting on Friday, and for the bank holiday later this month. Yesterday, the union also voted in favour of taking industrial action on the Virgin Trains' East Coast Main Line, while RMT members on Southern Railway have already been on strike this week over planned changes to the roles of conductors. The union blames the rail operators for ignoring their concerns. It's a, a real issue for our members on Eurostar. Uh, they uh, voted by a large majority to take industrial action. We've been seeking to get a resolution with the company. It has failed so far, uh, and therefore industrial action is likely to go ahead. But the government today suggested the Eurostar disruption was part of a wider union agenda. The series of strikes that only damages people who travel on the railways is simply unacceptable. It's curiously ironic that on a day that the government is announcing a huge investment programme in the railways with better services and better trains, that the unions are calling more strike action against progress and against moving forward and against modernising the passenger experience. It's simply not good enough. Eurostar services were still operating a normal timetable today, but passengers are waiting to see how travel plans will be affected on the targeted dates, with the language being used by both sides giving little cause for optimism. Paul Davis, ITV News. And Angus Walker joins us live from outside St Pancras Station this lunchtime, where that Eurostar strike action will start on Friday. And Angus, have you picked up any sense of the level of disruption that this is likely to cause? Yeah, the arrival from Paris has just uh, come in a couple of minutes ago. The, the company, no surprise, keen to play down any sense there will be major disruption, saying that maybe as two services per day could be cancelled and pointing out they run about 60 services a day. They say passengers are being contacted and offered alternative departure times if they are affected. So the firm saying that, no, there won't be major disruption. But... The other point I mentioned at the beginning, and Paul touched upon it as well, this is the third major rail company involved in a dispute with the RMT and, to a lesser extent, TSSA. Is Mr Grayling right to say that there's a growing appetite for a fight? Yes, I think uh, talking to one government adviser today who put it to me that it was uh, quite a coincidence, as he put it, that there are now three disputes with companies that account for about 100 million passenger journeys per year. So certainly the sense that now we have a series of strikes, but this is also escalating into a wider political confrontation with pressure now from Labour on Chris Grayling, the Transport Secretary, to get involved to urge the companies to get into talks with the union. This is getting bigger and bigger. Angus, thank you.
Now, day four of the Rio Olympics upped Team GB's medal haul with not one but two silvers. Britain's swimming success is fast becoming one of the biggest achievements of the Games, with athletes already winning more medals at Rio than at this stage in London 2012. Swimmer Siobhan Marie O'Connor added record-breaking pride to her medal achievement, and there was success too for the men's 200-metre relay team, the first silver medal for Britain in that contest for over 100 years. Here's Olivia Kinsley with the details. Britain Siobhan Marie O'Connor knew very well that only the race of her life would be good enough for a medal, so no pressure. In the red cap, she began shoulder to shoulder with Hungarian favourite Katinka Hozu. Butterfly back and breaststroke done, the Hungarian came out of the final turn ahead, but in a valiant effort, O'Connor pushed to the end and to a silver medal, just 0.08 seconds off the gold, with which Hozu set a new Olympic record. Team USA in five, Great Britain in four. The next race, Britain were up again, this time the men for the 200-metre freestyle relay. They moved from fourth to third, then outstanding swims from Dan Wallace and James Guy saw GB even gaining ground on the USA's superhuman Michael Phelps. But the American held on. Gold to USA, silver to Great Britain. For Michael Phelps, a remarkable 21st Olympic gold, making him the world's most successful Olympian. Have a seat. <laughs> and so exhausted, the celebrations would have to wait. Are you going to come back, Michael? For Britain, too, it had been a stunning night. Best result for 108 years. Silver medals for these young men. And for 20 year old Siobhan Marie O'Connor, who gave it her all and got her reward. Olivia Kinsley, ITV News. Stunning achievement there from the American swimmer Michael Phelps, as Olivia reported. But not such good news for another Olympic Down champion, tennis star shocker. Serena Williams. The four-time Olympian has been knocked out of the Games after a shock defeat to the world number 20, Elena Svitolina. Williams lost in straight sets to the Ukrainian and bows out of the Games, having already lost out in the doubles alongside sister Venus. And spare a thought for Ethiopian swimmer Robel Kiros Habte, who finished 12 seconds behind his rival in his 100-metre freestyle heat. The 24-year-old said, despite finishing a distant third in a three-man field, he was delighted with his swim. Good for him. Staying with the swimming and Britain's success in the pool. Our sports reporter Amy Lewis joins us live from Rio. We are doing better than we did in London 2012. So what's the secret of these swimmers, Amy? Yeah, we certainly are, Alistair. Back in London 2012, we were expected to get five medals in the pool, but we actually only managed to get three. It was seen at the time as massively disappointing. The sport went through funding cuts and major reform, and it certainly paid off, because this time round, we've already won four medals, one gold and three silvers. In fact, it's the most successful time that British swimmers have had in the pool since the 1984 Los Angeles Games. And tonight, there's going to be more prospects, uh, and the swing actually goes on until Saturday. Andrew Willis is going to be in the pool tonight in the 200 metre breaststroke final last night. He won his semi final. The diving it didn't go quite as well yesterday. Take a look at these pictures. Tonya Couch and also her partner, Lawrence Toulson, they only finished fifth in the diving. So they didn't manage, unfortunately, to get a medal. But everyone was talking more about the colour of the water than what they were at the performances. Uh, and that's because it was bright green. The organisers have reassured the swimmers that it's all safe and the divers, but they still haven't given any explanation as to why it's that colour. Amy, thank you very much indeed. And we will be returning to Rio a little later, looking ahead to our medal hopes today. And finding out why Siobhan Marie O'Connor's road to that silver medal was not exactly smooth.
But first, a shortage of doctors may force one accident and emergency department to close overnight. The NHS Trust that runs Grantham Hospital in Lincolnshire says failing to act may put patients at risk and overnight closure is the safest option. And whilst it's no surprise perhaps to them, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine claims that it is a sign of a real crisis facing the health service. Well, Ben Chapman is outside Grantham A&E for us live this lunchtime. So these are serious warnings, Ben, about a staff shortage causing the problem. Yes, although this A&E department is relatively quiet this lunchtime, the trust which runs this hospital says it has now reached crisis point because it simply cannot recruit enough doctors trained in A&E to fill the shifts across its three hospitals. If we look at the figures, this hospital here in Grantham will expect to see 29,000 visits a year. That's about 80 patients every day. And across its three sites here and in Boston and also in Lincoln, they would normally have 15 consultants on duty along with 28 middle grade doctors. It currently has just 14 consultants, 10 of whom are locums, and just 12 middle grades. Now, it blames this on a national shortage of doctors trained to work uh, in A&E. It says it's left its staff under enormous pressure, and it says the solution is to close this A&E unit overnight, which it insists is, under the circumstances, the safest option for patients. We've looked very carefully to see what the impact it would have on um, patients coming at night and we're looking and working with our GP colleagues to see how we can mitigate that to ensure that patients can still, still receive appropriate medical advice and care out of hours. It's not something that they should worry about. The whole aim is ensuring that we can provide safe emergency care uh, across, uh, uh, across Lincolnshire. What's the picture nationwide, Ben? Well, it's not just this trust who've described this as a crisis. The British Medical Association, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine have used the same word today, saying uh, that there is a real recruitment and retention problem. And they say it's a vicious cycle, that the more pressure there is on staff, the harder it will be to recruit more staff. And they say this won't be the last hospital that has to take action like this. Ben, thank you. Three people have been killed and thousands have been evacuated from their homes as wildfires sweep across the Portuguese island of Madeira. Flames have now reached the capital and smoke's disrupting flights at the island's airports. The fires have been burning for two days on the islands off northwest Africa, experiencing high summer temperatures. Here, Prime Minister Theresa May and Russian President Vladimir Putin have pledged to improve ties between Britain and Russia. Down the street says the two leaders spoke on the phone for the first time to discuss ways of fighting terrorism. And the Duke of Westminster, one of the world's richest men, has died after a sudden illness. The Duke was a close friend to the royal family and a wealthy landowner. He'll be succeeded by his son Hugh Grosvenor, a godfather to Prince George. The level of sexual harassment in the workplace around the country has been branded shameful, with unwelcome jokes, suggestive remarks and unwanted touching amongst a list of complaints. A survey by the TUC of 1,500 women found that four out of five said they had experienced sexual harassment but didn't tell their employer. Jonah Partridge reports. When Faye Blenkinsop first received unwelcome sexual comments from her boss at a small property company, she didn't know where to turn. It escalated very quickly, um, yeah, to the point where it was happening every day. I was getting phone calls, you know, out of work, 20, 30, 40 phone calls. Um, I had a company mobile phone, he would sometimes cut that off if I wouldn't talk to him. Um, I felt like, a, you know, a prisoner in my own home, in my own world. Her boss's behaviour became more obsessive. Faye put up with it for years before she plucked up courage to go to the police. While Faye's experience was extreme, she's not alone. A new study from the TUC Union and the Everyday Sexism Project found half of all women have experienced some sexual harassment at work. Among young women aged 18 to 24, it's even more prevalent, with two-thirds affected. Sexual harassment can take many forms. The survey found that one third had been subjected to unwelcome jokes. A quarter had received sex-related comments about their body or clothes. A quarter had been touched and one in eight said someone had tried to kiss them. The survey's the biggest of its kind in a generation. In 90% of cases, the perpetrator was male. 
The problem hasn't gone away and the TUC wants it taken more seriously. We're calling on employers to really get tough and show that they're getting tough on sexual harassment, on the government to make changes like getting rid of employment tribunal fees so that women can get access to justice and you know, encouraging everyone to join a union. The TUC's produced a booklet giving practical advice on how to tackle harassment if it happens. If this is happening to somebody out there and you're not quite comfortable with it, then it's not right. No one should have to suffer in silence. Faye's employer was given a suspended jail sentence. She's since set up a business and is now her own boss. Joanna Partridge, ITV News. Well, I'm delighted to be joined live in the studio by Paula Chan on the left of your picture. She's an employment solicitor specialising in workplace discrimination. And on the right of your screen, Laura Bates, the founder of Everyday Sexism Project, a movement that aims to take steps toward gender inequality. The fact that so many of those women wouldn't complain is at the heart of your problem, is it not? It is, yes. In fact, this was a joint report from the Everyday Sexism Project and the TUC, and we were really shocked to hear the sheer number of women who didn't feel able to come forward. What's crucial, I think, is that of those who did report it, 75% said nothing changed, and 16% further said that things actually got worse. Yeah. So we need employers to really take action and deal with this. Because the other fact of the matter, which you know as a, as a lawyer, is a lot of what this survey has discovered is simply illegal. Absolutely. There is a case to answer. That's right. It's not only unacceptable behaviour in the workplace, but it's unlawful. The Equality Act 2010 says that sexual harassment at work is against the law and women shouldn't have to put up with that kind of behaviour at work. And women are able to raise concerns about discrimination and be protected by the law through victimisation protection. Yeah. The other intriguing thing about it, and um, we were talking... At about it at length upstairs is the degree to which it's an age thing not a gender thing so there's an older generation who might think well it's still all right and a younger generation of men I'm talking about who would say completely inconceivable that that's acceptable do you find that in the survey as well an age difference well I'm not sure if that's what we find we do find something interesting about age in the survey which is that 52 percent of all women have experienced some form of sexual harassment so this is a universal problem but I mean the ones who are committing the harassment I the see. men we don't actually have a breakdown by age of perpetrator, but we do know that 63% of young women have experienced sure. it. Do you pick up that on the age thing, that it's more likely to be older men than younger men? I think that what the survey has found is that many of the perpetrators are well, often in more senior positions, yeah. so that may be age-related, and it may be that it's a culture thing and we're looking to eradicate that, but I think it is across the board, unfortunately. The other thing, and I, when I was researching you, not just the survey, but you yourself, in your, as it were, quotes of people who are pleased with the work that you've done, there's a woman who worked in the aviation industry and there's a woman who worked in my industry. Yep. Are there industries that are particularly bad at this? There are industries that are particularly bad and we see various sectors, um, particularly male-dominated sectors yeah. where women experience more harassment. So that would include, in particular, financial services, that would include media, that would include construction and property. So we do find um, higher numbers of women complaining about that kind of conduct sure. and harassment. What's your single most important message to women listening to this conversation? Well, I think, honestly, the most important message is to government and employers. We yeah. shouldn't be looking to victims to solve this problem. We need employers to take action to tackle it and we need the government to revisit issues like tribunal fees and third-party harassment. OK, fine. Laura and Paula, thank you both very much indeed for coming in and taking part in that conversation. Thank Appreciate you. it. Now, uh, we are running a, a poll on our website, itv.com forward slash news. Do let us know if you've experienced harassment in the workplace. And our main story is this lunchtime. Eurostar rail workers have voted to go on strike in a dispute over work-life balance. Services will be affected this weekend and later this month over the bank holiday. And there were two silvers for Britain in the pool in Rio, the men's 200-metre relay team, and a medal for Siobhan Marie O'Connor. Well, her family and friends were on the edge of their seats watching as she clinched that silver. At her grandparents' home in Bath, there was an even an expectation that she might get gold. But they were pretty happy with second place, particularly because Siobhan has had to deal with chronic bowel disease in the run-up to the game. So her journey to a medal has been far from easy. Here's Suzanne Verdi. It was a tough watch for Doreen and Dave. 
a tinge of disappointment as she's pipped to the gold, but then the glorious realisation their granddaughter had won silver in the women's 200 metres individual medley. She, yeah. could, she couldn't give any more than that she did there. That was fantastic. Oh. It's a moment she's worked towards ever since she was a girl. Siobhan from Bath has always been determined. She missed her school prom in 2012 to go to the British National Championships, where she won gold in the 100 metres breaststroke. Siobhan began her gruelling training schedule here in Bath. Unbeknown to her, though, she had chronic bowel disease. Diagnosed in 2013, Siobhan suffers from ulcerative colitis, which weakens her immune system and brings regular bouts of tiredness. With the help of advice from people like Steve Redgrave, she, uh, she's coped with it and uh, she has to take, keep on a very strict diet and even take her own specialised food out to Brazil with it. Since, since it's been diagnosed, she's learned how to cope with it and she's one of these girls that she'll just get on with it and she'll do what she's supposed to do and very tough girl, doesn't complain and just gets on and does, gets the job done. Aged just 16, she was the youngest British swimmer to compete at the 2012 Olympics. The little girl who had a big sporting dream is in for one big party when she gets home. Suzanne Verdi, ITV News. And as promised, a final word from our sports reporter, Amy Lewis, there live in Rio. So you told us all about the success in the pool earlier and even funny colours, but it is a big day elsewhere for Team GB. What have we got to look forward to, Amy? Well, the time trial is taking place here in the cycling. It's just been confirmed that Emma Pooley, who is representing Britain, will not win a medal, but hopefully uh, a better performance and we'll see more chances from Chris Froome a little later. He's also going to be representing Britain. He, of course, has just won the Tour de France. He's trying to uh, win his first ever Olympic medal uh, and wants to put behind him the disappointment of not winning a medal in the men's road race at the weekend. In the gymnastics here at the Olympic Park later, Mats Wicklock is going to be representing Britain in the individual event. It's been confirmed here this morning that uh, there will not be any rowing because of the weather so 22 events are going to have to take place another time just a quick look at the medal tally we're currently on six this time in London we were on just four Amy thank you very much indeed the latest from Rio on the ITV evening news at 6 30 but that is it from us this lunchtime a very good afternoon to you bye bye